Hello, welcome to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, second day of the uh, Strategic Vision 2020 conference. Uh, I'm Stan Grant, I'll be your moderator and, and host of this session and in discussion here with uh, a man who probably doesn't need a lot of introduction, but certainly known to, to many of us in Australia, former Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, also former Foreign Minister, twice Foreign Minister, in fact, Sir Rabbi Namalu. It's lovely to have you with us, Sir Rabbi. Oh, thank you, Stan. A, a, lot to, a lot to discuss um, around the Pacific, both Papua New Guinea on its own, but also more broadly throughout the Pacific. And we're going to hoping to touch on issues such as climate change, obviously, the implications of that, strategy, security, um, geopolitics of the region, Australia's role in the region, uh, questions of defence, obviously, as well. But all of this conference, Sir Rabbi, is being framed by coronavirus and our responses to it and the implications it's having for the way we live, our economies and, and our political lives as well. Uh, you've had a spike in recent days in Papua New Guinea, particularly in Port Moresby. Just tell us what the situation is there right now and how the country is managing to deal with this. Well, for most of the last uh, four months since March, we uh, were able to, uh, to, to contain the spread of the, uh, the virus uh, quite successfully, actually, uh, for a long time there. The number of cases remained at about eight. Mm. Um, and then uh, it went up uh, to 11, uh, three cases that included uh, two soldiers, um, an Australian officer, actually, and a Papua New Guinean uh, uh, officer, who were both based at, uh, uh, at uh, the defense headquarters here at Murray Barracks. And, uh, and then the third case was related to the, the, uh, uh, the second case. Mm staying together in the same accommodation facilities, obviously, she must have uh, contracted it. Uh, and this is this is the concern, Sir Rabbi, isn't it? It's it's when it takes hold and you have hot spots and it spreads so quickly. I, I wanted to, to talk about the what, what you're doing to mitigate that risk, but also the vulnerability uh, when it comes to your own health services to deal with with a real spike in numbers. That, that's right. And, and that, that's something that the, uh, the government Prime Minister uh, continued to stress uh, that uh, our, our health uh, facilities uh, are limited in so many way, ways um, in terms of uh, uh, ICU facilities. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got about 74 in the whole country. Um, and, and so any spike which uh, escalates beyond the number that uh, that number would obviously pose a significant uh, uh, problem uh, for our, our health uh, facilities in this country. Uh, that said, uh, obviously one thing that uh, this has given ri uh, rise to over the last uh, uh, month or so uh, is uh, for the government uh, to, uh, uh, and uh, through the provincial governments uh, as well, uh, to set up, uh, allocate resources to, uh, to set up uh, facilities in the provinces uh, for, mm -hmm. for isolation and facilities for uh, quarantine. And so uh, in uh, an increasing number of provinces now, we have those facilities. Uh, fortunately, so far, they haven't uh, had have to be used. Mm. Although Port Moresby, because of the spike in a lot, over the last seven days in particular, where we've seen a, 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 um, a significant uh, increase from 17 last week to 27 by about 10 mm. uh, today. Um, the facilities that uh, have been set up here in Port Moresby are obviously um, uh, beginning to uh, uh, to experience a little bit of uh, uh, up upward pressure in terms of the use of the uh, qu quarantine and, and isolation facilities that have been set up. So, Rabbi, you're, you're no stranger to dealing with um, with illnesses on a, on a quite a large scale. Of course, you've had you know big outbreaks of tuberculosis, malaria, um, and HIV. As well, I noted in the 2013, in PNG's 2013 Defence White Paper, it identified specifically pandemic as a strategic threat. What have you learned from those previous experiences that you can adapt now? And how great a threat is this beyond just the immediate health crisis? But if you're talking about uh, including it in a, in a defence strategy, what broader implications does an outbreak of a virus like this have? 
Yes, and and it uh, obviously was addressed in in uh, in the context of us having you know borders. Obviously, mm. major outbreak uh, across the border, for instance, in uh, uh, in in Papua, uh, would have uh, you know significant uh, implications for us because we have uh, a border arrangement with uh, with Indonesia, which allows for uh, traditional what we call traditional crosses, and they're basically. Uh, uh, people who live on the border that have rights to cross onto the other side and vice versa, because they in more, more invariably belong to the same tribal groupings, same linguistic groupings. So that that's one reason. But the other reason also uh, was the, the number of outbreaks that we've had in this country, even though they may not have been as widespread throughout the country. Nonetheless, uh, when they've happened, they, they have affected uh, uh, a uh, uh, you know, population in, in our country that we, we've uh, wanted to avoid ever since. Uh, we've had, obviously, health, uh, HIV, SARS, um, malaria, uh, uh, measles. Mm. We even had a, a small outbreak of polio um, uh, some months ago. So, so we've, we've gone through uh, uh, a number of these things which uh, have uh, obviously uh, uh, taught us to uh, uh, be uh, uh, to be to take every precaution and put in measures in place uh, to ensure that uh, uh, if there's a major major outbreak of this kind, and obviously in this case uh, I think uh, it was obviously prophetic in some ways, mm. I was knowing that there was going to be a, a major COVID uh, outbreak in the world, uh, never mind Papua New Guinea. It, it, it assisted uh, us with uh, with our planning. And so the government uh, moved very quickly once uh, the World Bank, uh, the World Health Organization um, declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic. And they moved quickly to set up a, uh, a national emergency um, response and preparedness uh, uh, strategy, which uh, included some of those ideas that the Defense White Paper uh, had uh, uh, alluded to in that report. Mm. Uh, 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 in terms of addressing a, a major outbreak uh, of uh, a disease like uh, COVID-19. You, you mentioned West Papua, and, and we're going to come to the broader discussion about that a little bit later. But I just want to stay with the consequences of this particular moment and what coronavirus is and how it's reshaping so much of, of our world. It's not just Papua New Guinea, but other parts of the Pacific as well. If you look at a country like Fiji, for instance, that relies so heavily on tourism. Well, tourism everywhere now is just uh, completely damaged. I mean, that, that industry is, is on its knees. And does it, does it then flow that a poorer region, a more economically stressed region, becomes also a more disordered and dangerous region? Um, yeah, I guess uh, in some ways it could, uh, particularly if... Uh the region uh, does not receive, especially those that are more vulnerable, uh, are not re uh, receiving any offer of assistance uh, in, in the event that they don't have the capacity or capability to deal with a particular situation. Um, and they are then in a, posi in a position, you know, to uh, look elsewhere. In a situation like that, I think, uh, uh, it, it, it does uh, give rise to, it, it, and, and it can, to that type of situation. Fortunately, in, in the present uh, environment, at least in our case, and I'm sure it is true of the Pacific as a whole, where there have been an outbreak uh, of corona uh, outbreak or where we needed assistance to, to, to implement our strategy, we've had uh, uh, the, uh, we've been fortunate to have the assistance uh, of uh, uh, our partners in Australia, obviously, has been the most uh, uh, mm. prominent and uh, the most uh, uh, helpful of those partners. Uh, we've had uh, assistance, obviously, from uh, multilateral organizations like like the WHO, uh, the World Bank, and, and ADB, uh, but also uh, uh, bilateral uh, assistance from uh, countries like New Zealand, um, like uh, Japan, uh, uh, China, mm. uh, states. Uh, and, and all of these uh, have uh, assisted us enormously uh, to make sure 
uh, that uh, the strategy that we have uh, put in place uh, is implemented to the fullest extent. Without that help, you know, we might have become a lot more vulnerable mm. to uh, uh, having this outbreak uh, dealt with in a, in a manner in which it would have got out, out of hand a little bit. So, Rabbi, of course, there is a need for assistance to deal with the immediate threat of coronavirus and the health implications. But there is a broader political question here and a strategic question, and that is that assistance also leads potentially to competition, particularly competition for influence. Uh, you mentioned China. Australia is still, of course, the, the biggest donor to the region, but China now the third biggest donor in the region. What are the expectations of Chinese assistance? Does that also, as some have described it as a as a debt trap, as if there, there is a quid pro quo, as if that money comes with strings and that strings is uh, and those strings are influence. Yeah, I, I think uh, there's you know, there, there are always those risks, and it depends on how uh, how you know countries uh, negotiate and enter into these agreements. And it's obvious that in some cases where uh, um, those sorts of strings have been attached, uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese. Uh, uh, have obviously used those provisions uh, to uh, basically uh, take over uh, facilities or infrastructure that have mm. and and that's something that each country has to be aware of. Uh, and at the regional level, uh, obviously, we have to be conscious of it, and in, in uh, and in, in some ways, we have to assist each other as well in terms of how we deal with. Uh, these sorts of situations. In, in the Pacific, as you know, uh, we've had two groupings, basically. Mm -hmm. Diplomatic ties or relations with, uh, with the People's Republic of China. Uh, and there is a, a group also that have uh, diplomatic relations with Taiwan. And, and so, and, 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 and so Rabbi, that changes, as we've seen with, with, with the Solomons, for instance. And that is, a, is seen as a direct result of Beijing pressure. That's right. And, and so, that's, those are the sorts, sorts of questions uh, that become um, a real challenge for, for countries in the Pacific. You know, how do we address these types of questions? For instance, we've had diplomatic relations with China uh, since um, independence. So we've had a long uh, relationship with uh, China in that time. But we've also had uh, trade uh, relations with Taiwan. We have a separate... Uh, 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 arrangements with them. They have a trade office here uh, in, uh, uh, in in Papua New Guinea, Paul Mosby, and and so we've been able to uh, to deal with both uh, parties uh, for quite quite a long time. But 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 not so rabbi without some criticism because there was criticism from Taipei that that PNG was downgrading its relations with Taiwan because of pressure from Beijing. Is that a legitimate criticism? Yeah, I think uh, there's obviously been pressure. There's always been pressure. Uh, even uh, actually, has been pressure that goes back to the very beginning, where there was pressure not to allow them at all, even to set up a, a trade mission uh, here in, in, in uh, Papua New Guinea. But uh, in the end, uh, we managed to, uh, uh, to persuade them that the trade mission was primarily for uh, trade and investment purposes that we wanted uh, the Taiwanese government uh, to assist where they um, have offered previously uh, to uh, assist us in, in, uh, in, in projects which uh, they have the expertise uh, to assist us with, particularly in agriculture. And so they've been fairly active in, in that area for uh, uh, over 30 years now mm. uh, in assisting us uh, in, in agriculture, particularly with rice, you know, rice, uh, um, cultivation, rice, rice research, rice, rice production. We're getting a lot of comment initially and questions coming through, Sir Ravi, specifically about China. It's obviously eliciting a, a, a lot of interest and questions about the negative consequences of engaging with China. How does PNG perceive China's role? Um, will China be a more supportive partner for PNG than Australia? I, I wanted to just take those and and focus on, on Papua New Guinea and China. PNG had signed up to the, to, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and the expectations that comes with this. I want to specifically ask you about Papua New Guinea's decision to vote yes 
in a Human Rights Council, UN Human Rights Council resolution, supporting Beijing's national security law in Hong Kong. Could that be seen as acquiescing to that power from Beijing and the strings that are attached to financial support and investment? Uh, it, could, it could be seen and interpreted in, in that way, uh, not uh, being privy to uh, uh, what happened uh, when that vote was taken. I would assume that they would have uh, made uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an assessment and a calculation that uh, uh, this uh, would uh, obviously uh, help uh, uh, to uh, uh, support uh, uh, the relationship uh, and uh, that perhaps in view of the, the Belt and Road uh, um, arrangements that uh, we're part of, uh, that that was something that uh, uh, would have uh, to some extent influenced whatever decision that was arrived at. I <laughs> It, 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 it is extraordinary, though, isn't it? If you consider, I'm going to quote Jeff Wall, who you know, of course, is sure. writing writing for the for the, for Aspie on this, and he says, by voting to support the crushing of free speech and freedom of assembly among the basic rights, PNG voted against the spirit of its own constitution. Those values of free speech, rule of law, those values of free press are, are, are part of the foundational values of Papua New Guinea. How could PNG then support? Chinese actions in Hong Kong that limit those rights. It's a good, it's a good question, and I, and, and I'm sure that uh, publicly here, uh, if uh, the public would have been asked uh, before the vote was taken uh, as to how we should vote, in some very very interesting uh, um, comments in regard to uh, to the vote. In fact, in, in 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 many ways, it was a vote that was taken in in the, in, uh, in New York. Uh, perhaps, in, well, obviously, we're in consultation with the government back here, but it was uh, uh, as much a surprise to uh, many uh, to for Papua New Guinea to have voted for it as it was uh, uh, for Papua New Guinea um, to take a position uh, that we should not have voted uh, for that uh, uh, for that uh, uh, vote. But that said, obviously, mm -hmm. that PNG uh, adopted on the day of the vote. We know that China uh, will push back against decisions that it doesn't like and, and make its own threats, if you like, as, as well. And I, I want to just discuss quickly here some of the tensions that, that, have, uh, that have emerged, uh, particularly around issues of resources. Um, there were tensions over the decision not to renew the lease of the Zhijin mining group and warnings from China directly that not renewing this lease would have significant impact of relations with China. That is direct pressure, isn't it? How does it Papua is. New Guinea manage to deal with that, given that, that you need that support, you need that infrastructure, you need that relationship, but you also need to protect your own sovereignty? Yeah, that, that's right. And, and that's why uh, um, the government has basically stated its position in relation to, uh, uh, to Pogra Mine, in which uh, the company that you mentioned is involved. And uh, uh, it uh, uh, so far, uh, it is uh, not relenting on that position. Uh, obviously, uh, the court has just ordered that there be mediation between uh, the parties, between the government as well as uh, the companies uh, 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 that are involved in Pogera uh, and, and the landowners and provincial governments. But uh, so far, the PNG government is uh, saying, no, this is our position. Uh, we may be prepared to uh, to negotiate a settlement out, outside of uh, outside of the courts if that's what the court uh, decides but we're not going to change this position that's mm -hmm. the saying it's often said of australia sir ravi that Sorry? we it's often said of australia that we don't have to choose between our close security relationship with the united states and our trade relationship with china we know that that's becoming increasingly difficult as China and the United States uh, square off and have their own tensions in so many different areas, and Australia really at the hinge point of those tensions. Should a similar thing be said of Papua New Guinea? Are there choices to be made at some point between, say, China and Australia when it comes to, to influence and relationship? Well, uh, ho hopefully it won't come to that uh, stage, but, but obviously Papua New Guinea will have to assess its own uh, position obviously uh, that you know up until this stage we've, we've had very good relations uh, with China as well as with Australia and uh, we've had a foreign policy since independence which uh, basically articulates uh, a, a position of uh, uh, non-alignment basically you know a, a universal 
policy of friend to all, uh, enemy to none. And that's uh, kept uh, our foreign policy position fairly independent uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, the uh, period uh, since independence. And uh, uh, it hasn't changed significantly since then. Um, obviously, any choice, if you have, if it has to be made, mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, assessed and analyzed by the government uh, uh, at the time uh, to see what is in, what is best in our national interest. Uh, but uh, you know, I know uh, that the vast majority of our people here uh, regard Australia as a very close friend. Uh, Australia has obviously, you know, been a partner of this country for uh, a very long time, uh, and was the former administering power in this country. So. Mm. So much uh, that we we have inherited from uh, that uh, from the Australian administration, um, which uh, uh, which have have been become part of our our own culture, our own political milieu, and uh, the institutions that we have in this country. That I don't believe it would uh, uh, it, 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 uh, it would be that difficult for this country to uh, to make their choice. I want to come back to that Australia relationship and look at that more broadly throughout the Pacific and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Pacific Step Up uh, initiative as well. But uh, picking up that, that idea of, of friend to all, enemy to none, it is so difficult in this contested space now, right now. We're getting questions have been coming through about, um, uh, uh, about West Papua, uh, about Indonesia and, and negotiating the tensions around that. Um, one question very bluntly said, um, why, do, if, why is Papua New Guinea not supporting the independence movement in West Papua? Other questions saying, how do you envisage the relationship with Indonesia moving forward, given the tensions that exist around West Papua? What are your thoughts on that? Well, f f firstly, you, you would not um, uh, uh, appreciate the position that we are in, Papua New Guinea is in, until you live next to uh, a country. Um, with the size of Indonesia, mm. you know, that, that uh, obviously presents its own challenges. Uh, and uh, whilst uh, we have uh, developed since independence a very good, very close, sometimes uh, in the past it's been bumpy along the way, relationship with Indonesia, uh, by and large, it's, uh, it's a relationship that's uh, led to, uh, uh, to a, 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 a strong bilateral, you know, relationship. That said, We've always, uh, we've all also used the opportunity on occasions uh, in the past uh, to um, uh, raise this issue in, in West Papua with the Indonesian government official level, uh, even though we recognize that it is an internal matter for the Indonesian government. But when you share a border with a country like Indonesia, uh, you obviously have to tread very carefully as to how you raise this issue. Uh, that said, uh, obviously, there are people along, living along the border who belong to the same ethnic groupings, same, mm. English, same culture, they move to and fro. And that was something that uh, was recognized by both governments uh, at the beginning when uh, they, they entered into uh, uh, this bilateral uh, relationship. Now, I understand the diplomatic um, tensions, the diplomatic dance, if you like, in having to negotiate those those issues with a very big and very powerful and increasingly uh, powerful neighbour. Uh, but there are issues of human rights that do need to be dealt with. Um, allegations that you hear constantly of violations of human rights. Indeed, during coronavirus, there are allegations that, that uh, there are human rights violations as Indonesia seeks to control the spread of COVID-19 in West Papua. Um, there are also uh, violence, ongoing com complaints about violence and and killings. How do you do deal with that very directly with a country like Indonesia, given the diplomatic tensions, the diplomatic negotiations that you have to be able to traverse here when you have serious allegations of those levels of abuses? And the way that we've dealt with that since independence is to use the framework that uh, the bilateral framework that we've established, uh, because it, it, amongst other things, it enables both uh, countries to, to meet uh, at least once or twice a year where issues of this nature can be raised at that sort of level. And they have in fact been raised at that, uh, uh, at that level uh, whenever these uh, 
uh, bilateral meetings have been held. That was, uh, uh, that's, it, it, it's proven to be a useful um, mechanism for both countries to uh, not only uh, share uh, views on, on uh, issues to, uh, relating to, uh, to the border or uh, to our bilateral relationship uh, generally, but in terms of uh, Papua especially, of uh, uh, allegations of uh, human rights um, abuses, uh, as well as uh, uh, COVID, you know, th these uh, issues have been raised uh, directly with, uh, with the government through that uh, bilateral uh, forum, bilateral relationship uh, uh, forum that is uh, included in the uh, agreement between the two countries. And we have, we have uh, regular meetings here with, uh, uh, at, at the uh, official level uh, in relation to, to, the, to this uh, COVID, um, uh, to the COVID-19, because obviously one of the things that had to be done when uh, the state of emergency was, uh, uh, was, was uh, imposed was to have the, the border uh, uh, entries uh, uh, closed. And that included uh, the main one up in the West Tipi. Uh, between uh, uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, uh, and uh, uh, West Papua, where the the uh, uh, main entry point was closed to all uh, to the to all traveling uh, to the traveling public, mm -hmm. and both in terms of uh, uh, those that were involved in trade uh, and tourism, or for any business whatsoever. As we discuss West Papua, you could appreciate we're getting a lot of comments and questions coming in about Bougainville. Let's let's turn to that. Um, there was a referendum supporting independence, which was carried around 97, almost 98 uh, percent, very close to 100 uh, percent. Now, the Prime Minister Marapi says that that is non-binding. There are elections pending now in Bougainville as well. Uh, how can it be non-binding when it is clearly an expression of an almost unanimous will of the people yes and that's the reason for why in in that agreement uh in the in the peace agreement it, it was uh, provided uh, for that there would be consultations between uh, the, the national government and uh, the bougainville government in the event uh that uh, uh that outcome uh, was achieved and obviously it's been achieved so after the election uh those consultations will uh, will begin between the leaders, uh, between the prime minister, obviously, and his team, and the president, the newly elected president of Bougainville after the election, and his team, uh, to uh, uh, commence the consultations that will lead to uh, hopefully what uh, will become a mutually agreed position on this question, which which has to be uh, endorsed by the national parliament. Could I just drill down on that though? When you say a mutually agreed position, we have a position of the Bougainville people that is almost unanimous. So we know what that, what that position is, don't we? Yes, we do. And, and uh, you know, the questions that have to be addressed relate to timing. You know, do you, do, do the, does that mean that independence uh, has to be, um, be granted you know, straight away, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure in place to accommodate uh, that? So that obviously they have to, to, to discuss amongst other things, the sorts of uh, transition arrangements uh, that will have to be put in place to, to allow that to happen. And it may happen over a short period of time, over a long period of time. Those are the questions that will have to be addressed in those consultations. When we're talking about independence movements, whether it be West Papua, whether it be Bougainville, these are clearly big challenges for sovereignty. And history tells us how difficult these things can be to negotiate, how dangerous they can be. And we know how violent uh, this can be as well. You were while you were Prime Minister, the rebellion, of course, in Bougainville, as Foreign Minister, you were part of, of, of the negotiations there uh, as well. What are the concerns moving forward about the increasing pressure for independence, both West Papua, Bo Bougainville as well, but also what that could trigger more broadly within Papua New Guinea? Yeah, I think it's in, in relation to Bougainville, the Bougainville um, people obviously uh, want to make sure that uh, whatever uh, whatever agreed position that is uh, arrived at by both uh, the, the national government and the Bougainville um, government is one that will allow them or enable them uh, to uh, uh, have that objective uh, achieved, but hopefully uh, over a p 
period of time that will enable them to put in the, the uh, uh, appropriate uh, and necessary infrastructure, the institutions that are required uh, during uh, a transitional period, uh, and the economic uh, base uh, that uh, is required for an independent nation to stand on its own feet. Those, those are uh, serious questions that have to be addressed. They have raised them themselves, but you know, uh, obviously it's been raised uh, at the national level as well. Uh, and it's up to to the uh, consultations to uh, to discuss them, and then to to arrive at whatever uh, appropriate position on each of those major issues uh, mm -hmm. that provide uh, to make it happen. In relation to uh, West Papua, well, that's uh, you know that's that's obviously a, a question which uh, many of our neighbours or a number of our neighbours have raised at forum like the the Pacific Forum, uh, like the uh, uh, Melanesian Spearhead Group. And, it, and it's something that is uh, beginning to uh, gain traction as well overseas or internationally. But it, it's, it's something that I think uh, the Indonesian government is also uh, aware of. Uh, and I know that uh, mm. over time they've made, uh, they've introduced some reforms in West Papua to accommodate uh, some of the issues or concerns that have been raised to give greater autonomy to, of the people of West Papua. There are consequences that flow from all of that and for other countries in the region. You've mentioned Indonesia, clearly Australia as well. Um, any independence movements, uh, any independence, say, in Bougainville, then raises questions of influence elsewhere. Elsewhere, We've talked about China, for instance. Uh, that it, 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 is, it is, well, perhaps destabilising, but certainly complicating to a geostrategic, geopolitical picture of this region. That's right. That is correct. It's not an e it's not easy. It's not an easy. Uh, there's no e easy solution uh, or quick fix solution to it. It's something that uh, you need to uh, to discuss over and over and over a period of a long period of time because it's uh, it's a difficult and complex uh, issue and uh, it, it requires uh, uh, you know cool heads mm -hmm. to uh, to address uh, uh, the issue. Uh, hopefully, with a view to, uh, uh, to coming up with uh, a, you know, a, a solution that could gradually, over a period of time, give uh, greater autonomy to the people of West Papua. Sir so, Robbie, I, I want to turn to defence because clearly all of what we're discussing here has consequences and implications for defence. And going back to the 2013 white paper, it outlined a process of, a, of an incremental increase in the size of the defence force, which is now around about two to 3,000 in terms of people power, to getting to 10,000 by 2013. Is that achievable? No, it is not achievable, or it wasn't uh, obviously achievable in 2013, or even the time frame that was... Uh, well, to 2030, they're talking about by hitting that number, but you don't believe that that's possible? Well. It, it could be possible, but I think uh, it will be a difficult road to get there. Uh, so if we haven't achieved uh, even half of that since 2008, uh, 13, then, then obviously it, it just shows the challenges that are involved in, in making that happen. And, and the reforms talked about uh, a couple of things. One, uh, before that happened, uh, it talks about restructuring the defense force. So you have the three... Mm. Uh, being established uh, as, the, uh, as their own uh, silo units so that each uh, element, uh, let's say that, you know, the army or the defense, uh, the navy and, and the uh, uh, element have got their own uh, structure, which would enable them to have their own budget, which would enable them to uh, obviously decide their own priorities, something which cannot be done now under the present arrangement. That particular restructuring exercise is one that has not been uh, uh, put, implemented uh, because it's taking uh, much longer than I thought uh, to uh, have the new structure uh, sorted out at the uh, administrative uh, level. Once that's sorted out, then you can then start talking about the positions uh, that need to be established uh, to enable these numbers to be achieved. So at the moment, uh, the uh, the main priority seems to be on, on uh, recruiting with the, within the uh, existing numbers, 3,500, 3, 3, uh, but also training. And mm -hmm. in regard, uh, obviously, Australia uh, under the uh, uh, 
the Defence Force uh, Cooperation Agreement with Australia Papua New Guinea. Mm. Guinea was the major role in. in and, ju uh, and just ju just on that, what 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 is needed there in terms of of that agreement, and and what should change uh, if you're not going to be able to reach those projections? Uh, what is required then of that of that ag defence agreement with Australia? What uh, what 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 the uh, white paper talks about, amongst other things, is that, for instance, they should the three elements should be able to develop their own capacity, their own capabilities. For instance, uh, in logistics or equipment, um, and that's something that's all they all dealt together um, as one at the moment. What they need uh, from Australia to, to make that happen, obviously, is assistance in building up that, that capability or that capacity within each element uh, to make sure that they're in a position, for instance, if they need to uh, uh, procure additional equipment or, or uniforms or, or uh, uh, and a logistic uh, support, then they're in a position as uh, a separate uh, uh, organization um, all within the defense uh, uh, structure to be able to do that without having to be constrained by the fact that they're all together under one roof, which is the, the case at the moment. So that, that's the thrust of, of one of the things that that white paper uh, we uh, try to, to address. And it, it takes a while to separate the three elements when all three have been operating as one for quite a long time. Um, I think... Uh, Australia may be able to, uh, and, and probably are already, assisting uh, with uh, some of the, the discussions as to how best to do it, in ter both in terms of uh, structure and in terms of uh, 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 procurement. Let's look specifically at, at one, one issue that's been getting some pushback, some opposition, at least serious questions being raised about it, and that is the future of the Manus Island Joint Naval Base. The former Foreign Minister had raised questions about that as well. How seriously should we take the questions, the, opposi the opposition to this, or whether there is a uh, going back and, and looking at, at redrafting aspects of that agreement? How do you see that moving forward? Well, obviously, the Manus Provincial Government, uh, uh, through their governor, has uh, expressed very strongly uh, that uh, their views need to be taken into account in view of the experience that they've had. Uh, uh, so far with the uh, Asylum uh, Seeker Centre uh, over there. And, you know, that, that relates more to uh, uh, opportunities for, uh, uh, for their people in terms of uh, business of, uh, spin offs, but also uh, in terms of uh, what uh, infrastructure uh, development assistance uh, that can be uh, developed on, on in the province uh, under that arrangement. Um, it, it is uh, complicated by the fact that. Uh, uh, you have Australia and the United States um, wanting with PNG to develop it as a regional, you know, base. Obviously, at the moment, that's being done under the Defence uh, Force Cooperation Agreement with Australia, because obviously, uh, uh, and and that's an MOU rather than mm -hmm. a, uh, which allows uh, uh, for that to to happen. Now, but there are also serious uh, policy questions uh, if. We have to go beyond that, and that's something that the government needs to uh, to address. Well, it's been two years now. We still haven't moved forward on on the tender process. Is there a need to expedite this? Um, is this a go slow in your view from Australia? That's that that's that's uh, unnecessary or, or or unhelpful. Well, as, as I understand it, uh, they've actually done you know started uh, work on on some facilities over there in terms of construction. And that a major contractor uh, has been uh, selected to uh, uh, to uh, do uh, some of the work, and that they're, they're going ahead and, and doing it. So, so I guess uh, the question is, you know, is it too late now to uh, review the uh, arrangements to mm. take the the Manus uh, provincial government leaders are saying, because you, you don't want uh, this situation to to end up in the same place where. The last arrangements that uh, uh, PNG had with Australia in relation to the Manus uh, uh, Asylum Seeker Processing Facility was was uh, one that left many leaders on Manus, including the governor and the people, 
uh, terribly, terribly disappointed because things that were promised to them uh, were not delivered, things under the arrangements. And that's the sort of thing that they're, they're asking for. They want to avoid the same kind of experience um, with uh, uh, those sorts of issues, and they would like a review of the arrangements so that their views are fully taken into account. And of course, this feeds into the broader question of competition throughout the region and military competition throughout the region. And just returning to the earlier conversation we had about China and China's influence, the potential of China seeking a military base within the Pacific as well. And we saw questions raised around Vanuatu in the past, but particularly as China's influence increases, particularly as we see countries hit hard by coronavirus and, and, and sustaining economic damage, does that then become uh, a significant factor as well, that there is potential if China sought to establish a base, both economic, to, uh, you know, economic benefits that may flow, infrastructure benefits that may flow, but that raises really strategic questions diplomatically and, and strategically throughout the region for Australia, Papua New Guinea, uh, other countries in the region, the United States. Yeah, and, and that's right, and, and those are legitimate questions, and that's one that's uh, you know amongst those a question that we are really concerned about. The policy question that needs to be addressed is whether a regional base being set up by on Manus, either by the Chinese or by Australia in the United States, um, place Papua New Guinea in a position uh, where if a major conflict breaks out or a major dispute. Um, will involve Papua New Guinea automatically supporting the party uh, that or parties that are involved in, in setting up that base. And that's a serious question that I personally don't think has been addressed adequately enough because uh, uh, we, we're not covered by the ANZUS Treaty, for instance, or, for, or uh, by any treaties with uh, uh, China either. Uh, and it, it's, it's for a simple reason. You know, we've always espoused a um, friend to all, enemy to none uh, foreign policy, where we would prefer to uh, uh, avoid situations like that, where establishing a regional base on Manus, for instance, can, and hopefully it will not, um, put Papua New Guinea in a difficult position where it becomes involved in something that uh, it was never intended for Papua New Guinea to be involved in, in the first place. Yeah, we have about 15, 20 minutes left, and, and there are many things I want to discuss, um, particularly more broadly throughout the region. But let's just stay with a couple of issues that have been appearing here in the questions and comments that relate specifically to Papua New Guinea. Uh, we've had a few questions uh, and a few comments around women and status of women, domestic violence, of course, being an ongoing concern, but also uh, the representation of women in parliament. What is being done here, both on the uh, dealing with, with the scourge of domestic violence and also looking at, at achieving greater representation for women in your parliament? Yeah, the, the, the first issue in relation to uh, domestic violence, obviously, uh, uh, we had a uh, huge uh, turnout for, uh, 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 in, in protests against the latest uh, incidents in relation to a young woman who uh, was obviously killed by uh, her partner, uh, which uh, uh, attracted uh, widespread uh, and nationwide criticism uh, in leading to the whole country uh, turning out uh, in protest uh, against what has happened. I think uh, it is uh, becoming more and, and more acknowledged now that that's, that's a, 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 uh, an issue which uh, needs to be addressed uh, at the national level. The government itself uh, is uh, uh, addressing or has made a commitment to uh, put in additional measures that deal with uh, uh, with uh, domestic, uh, you know, violence, uh, it enacted a law. The Parliament enacted a law not too long ago, in fact, on this issue, on domestic violence, uh, to protect uh, women and children. But obviously, uh, there are questions uh, like uh, penalties, uh, as well as other issues related to that, that need to be reviewed by the government. That's what the government has, uh, uh, has uh, uh, announced it will do. But it's uh, to totally unacceptable. It's uh, abominable, uh, whatever it happens. And I think that there's increasing public awareness uh, on that now throughout the country. That said, uh, you know, it's, it's something that uh, I suppose uh, in a male dominated uh, uh, society, 
uh, is something that we'll have to, uh, to work very hard on, on overcoming. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the, the fact that the public generally is now becoming more and more uh, concerned about it, more aware, uh, will lead the government to take uh, uh, even more uh, uh, tougher and, and, and or measures that will help to address this question. On the question of women representation in parliament, as you know, since independence, I think the, large, the biggest number of women that we have had is about three in, uh, in Parliament. And that's uh, partly because we have not made special provision for women representation in Parliament, even though there have been uh, attempts from time to time uh, to do that, you know, to change the Constitution and allow for special seats to be created for women. In fact, uh, uh, when I was still uh, part of the government uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we, uh, uh, a number of us suggested uh, that uh, the 20 provinces, provincial seats in parliament, uh, should be abolished and be reallocated uh, for women uh, seats, where uh, you will have at least uh, 20 seats in parliament that uh, will be occupied by women to provide some balance to mm. representation in in Parliament. The, the uh, current Prime Minister uh, has uh, um, announced that he wants to uh, uh, create some special seats, uh, bring about a, an amendment to, pro to provide for, additional, for uh, special seats to be created so that we can then start to, to bring uh, in or see in Parliament at least uh, uh, a, a number, a special number or a certain number of women uh, that can begin to represent uh, uh, the uh, women population in relation, in, in, in addition to what seats that there are there now that can be contested by them um, as they've been doing uh, without much success since uh, independence, unfortunately. And that really raises another issue, which is an ongoing concern. And you spent, you know, you spent a long time in national parliament there, two decades, and that is the strength and health of Papua New Guinea democracy, a country that has seen coups as well in the past. What is your, what are your thoughts on the strength and resilience of democracy in PNG? And and if if there are areas of strengthening, you mentioned their representation of women. What other areas are needed to strengthen that? I think government uh, has obviously shown a, a tremendous amount of resilience. Uh, as a democratic institution. It has evolved uh, over, uh, nonetheless over the years, even though the, uh, the basic uh, constitutional foundation is still uh, you know, very strong. But there are things which we can improve on. Obviously, women uh, representation is, uh, is one. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, there's increasing pressure now for uh, boundaries uh, to be uh, reviewed uh, and for additional seats to, uh, to be created. Uh, because the population has obviously grown um, significantly since uh, independence. Uh, that uh, was done about 10 years ago when three additional news, three new uh, provinces were created. Um, and obviously uh, uh, there needs to be continuing, uh, continuing uh, training uh, and uh, courses uh, on democracy uh, workshops, which uh, in, 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 in uh, a number of cases, the Commonwealth, uh, uh, the Commonwealth Secretary has assisted with, uh, even the Australian uh, uh, federal mm. And of course, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke there before about coups. I meant to say crises, dip, uh, constitutional crises in the yeah. past, uh, in the past, not, not, not coups. But, but I, I wanted to look at, at, at the, 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 the layers of government as well. And there've been questions about being over-governed the number of provinces, national government, local government as well, does that need reform? Yeah, that, that's right. And, and uh, uh, the Papua New Guinea decided consciously to adopt a, a provincial government system because uh, it is so diverse. As, as you know, Stan, we, we have 800 different linguistic ethnic groupings in this country. Uh, and that's a, in itself is a huge challenge. And the country itself is uh, so diverse geographically uh, that uh, it was decided that the best way to uh, address these questions was to set up a system which would allow uh, some measure of decision-making to be uh, taken at, at the uh, local level. 
and so uh, the, the, the provincial government system was uh, was adopted as part of our constitution. But you know, over the years, obviously, uh, with experience, we we have uh, um, discovered uh, that uh, you know there are challenges that uh, need to be addressed uh, and reforms have to be brought in. In 1995, the parliament uh, brought in a, a series of reforms to the way that the provincial governments uh, um, were run. Those reforms uh, have been subject to, uh, uh, to uh, a review uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, there is a view uh, that perhaps uh, uh, rather than create, uh, you know, more provinces, you need to uh, focus on the provincial governments that are there right now and, and uh, uh, figure out how best to help uh, them improve their uh, systems uh, of, of, of uh, their administrative systems, their mechanisms for uh, service uh, delivery uh, at, the, uh, at the provincial and local level government level. And there are lots of questions too, Sir Rabbi, about aid and where aid ends up, whether it ends up um, being heavily bureaucratized, there are questions of corruption and particularly aid getting to the poorest people. And you live in one of the reg regional areas, rural areas, where you, you see up, up close the extent of the, the, the differences, the inequalities, the, the poverty that exists in the country. What does that look like when you see that level of, of poverty in rural areas and you don't see the money getting to where it's, it's most needed? Yeah, it's it's a it's it's a it's a very you know serious uh, question because in my province, for instance, which uh, I think is uh, true of many many provinces out there, where we're not uh, getting um, as much uh, money in terms of budgetary allocation as, as other areas, and where we don't have uh, major resource projects, then of course uh, it sets us back in terms of uh, of, of the sorts of uh, uh, level of uh, uh, budgetary support or uh, uh, other support from uh, other sources uh, that we should have uh, access to in a way for in a way in the same way for instance uh, as uh, those provinces that have uh, major resource uh, uh, projects uh, you know whether it's mining or, or oil and gas because uh, the law provides for uh, additional uh, benefits to go to those provinces uh, in a way that doesn't uh, that it doesn't to uh, Provinces that don't have a, don't have a major resource uh, projects. So, so it shows uh, quite uh, uh, drastically in some ways. Mm. Uh, road infrastructure, for instance, uh, being maintained is falling apart. Uh, health services, uh, education services. Uh, th these are uh, basic services that should be be getting any uh, funding uh, as a matter of uh, priority but it doesn't always come uh, on time uh, if it comes at all. And those, that's the sort of experience that uh, we have uh, going on all the time at the provincial. In the time I have left, I want to just broaden the canvas a little bit and look throughout the region and Australia's role in the region, particularly around Pacific Step Up and the language that the Prime Minister Scott Morrison has used about family. If we are in a, in a contest of influence and, and competition, if we see that China increases its, its, uh, its, its footprint in the region, is that how, how persuasive is that idea of, of a family, a Pacific family that Australia is a part of and that we share in, in, in history, in interests, in values? I, I think uh, uh, that, uh, you know, specific step up uh, was, a, was a good initiative because uh, for a long time uh, Pacific uh, leaders uh, felt uh, that uh, Australia uh, was uh, focusing uh, more on, on uh, the international level uh, at the expense of, uh, of the Pacific uh, and therefore um, uh, gaps were developing which uh, resulted in, in uh, other parties um, coming in uh, and attempting to take advantage of those gaps, uh, both in terms of uh, development uh, assistance uh, as well as uh, uh, investment uh, and uh, uh, other forms of, uh, uh, of assistance to, uh, to the area. Since uh, Pacific Step Up, uh, obviously, I mean, I think uh, some balance is being brought to bear 
And I think the people of the Pacific uh, are now, in the, at least for Papua, in, in terms of Papua New Guinea, uh, are now beginning to appreciate again that we do have a friend uh, who is a, a neighbor as well uh, that uh, uh, is prepared to uh, uh, devote uh, a bit more time and effort and resources to uh, uh, to be uh, to assist uh, in, in, within the region uh, because she is part of the region, and I think uh, you know, the the uh, coral sea cable, for instance, mm. uh, uh, was uh, completed uh, not too long ago uh, to the Solomon Islands to P and, and to PNG uh, is a a major major piece of infrastructure that has uh, uh, received a tremendous amount of goodwill in Papua New Guinea because uh, they, they regard that uh, as a project which Australia uh, has, has uh, uh, not only built, but done so because it believes very strongly that it is uh, part of this region and it is uh, something that will assist uh, not just these two countries, but the region enormously in terms of communication. That's not to say that there are not tensions, and specifically around climate change. Um, we have seen um, significant tensions around that. How do you see that going forward? I mean, clearly, the Pacific is at the front line of the impact of climate change, and we're seeing that already. Uh, into the future, we're going to see, for, we're forecast to see increasing movement of people, migration, refugees. There's going to be a requirement for more, more financial assistance, looking at citizenship and residency arrangements. And then, of course, there is Australia's reality, economic reality, that fossil fuel is, is a significant supplier of jobs and, uh, and, and an enormous export industry. They are, they are very delicate interests and values and responsibilities to navigate, aren't they? They definitely are, and um, I mean I think that's been demonstrated uh, demonstrated more than adequately uh, at uh, the regional forum, uh, so, uh, both at the level of the Pacific uh, Leaders Forum uh, as well as elsewhere. That there is uh, obviously a a strong dichotomy there between what uh, the small island states uh, how they feel about this question, and, and obviously Australia's uh, you know position um, in relation to climate change. It is something that is not easy. It's a major challenge. It's complex, um, and it is something that uh, needs to continue to be on the table for leaders to discuss, because uh, it is not uh, uh, a, uh, a black and white issue. Uh, Australia's uh, interests obviously uh, have to be uh, appreciated, uh, but the Pacific leaders also feel very strongly uh, that uh, their their concerns in relation to climate change and the impact of that on on uh, populations, on land, uh, as well as on other uh, aspects uh, of life, uh, need to be considered, uh, you know, seriously. And, and you've uh, mentioned uh, the, the question of immigration. Mm. Uh, you know, whether those that's that issue, amongst others, uh, should be begin to be discussed, and, and how best to to assist those that are in the most vulnerable position, and already. You know, some countries like Fiji are assisting um, some of those smaller, you know, countries uh, by offering to have them resettle uh, the Solomon Islands, Fiji, um, and and so on. Uh, they're not uh, easy questions because uh, major uh, cultural questions for the people that are dealing with in their own countries. So, Rabbi, we're almost out of time, but I do want to prevail upon you for such, just a final comment and. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think this is a frivolous point to finish on, but people-to-people -people contact is vital. Um, being able to have relationships of hearts and minds. And one of the things that Australia and Papua New Guinea share, of course, is a love of rugby league, um, in, certainly in the eastern states of Australia and Papua New Guinea. It is a religious fervour that the people there have to the game. What are the opportunities to explore through sport through the influence of rugby league, something that is so passionate, it's been talked about even bringing potentially a, a Papua New Guinean team into the into the major Australian competition, but also the possibilities that it provides for people to people contact, uh, diplomacy as a way of building that personal family relationship that the Prime Minister has talked about with South Pacific Step Up. Yes, and, and that's something that 
we uh, uh, did uh, uh, quite uh, well on it. Actually, people to people uh, uh, relationship uh, between here and Australia was something that we focused on uh, quite a bit uh, when, I, when I was prime minister. And I managed to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, get uh, Bob Hawke at the time, prime minister, and, and Paul Kidding to support the idea or proposal to have a thousand of our children um, be given scholarship sponsored to study mm -hmm. uh, and that went on for a number of years before that policy was discontinued but that was a a a, a, a very useful way to bring our young people to come and study in australia learn a little bit about australia get to know the australian people and then come back here and um, begin to influence um, the communities in which they live or in which they, they serve. I was very, very uh, uh, disappointed when the government at the time decided to, uh, uh, to uh, discontinue with that program. But, you know, rugby, obviously, uh, like you say, is a religion in, in this country. It's, it's probably the most popular legacy that we've inherited from, uh, from Australia at the independence. And every village has got its own little uh, rugby team. It's, uh, it's, it's in, in some ways, it's a great nation building um, uh, uh, activity because people play sport regardless of, of uh, what tribe they come from, uh, what, uh, uh, what district, what province. And it is one of the great unifying uh, factors in this country, uh, rugby, uh, because it brings our people together where they come from. We have a national team, which uh, is called the Hunters. And as you may be aware, the Hunters have now been participating in the Queensland Interest Super Cup and have been now for uh, the last uh, five years, I think, or a bit more than five years. Um, but the Hunters uh, won the Queensland Interest uh, Interest uh, Super Cup uh, the second year they played in the competition. Uh, so. So uh, that's uh, obviously given a pathway to those that uh, played in the Antis uh, to, uh, if they do well, uh, to then play or, or, or be offer themselves for recruitment to, uh, to the National Rugby uh, League in Australia. And, and some of them are in fact uh, playing for uh, uh, teams in, in, uh, in the Eastern States, in Melbourne or, or uh, in Sydney or in, uh, in, in Brisbane. Uh, some of them uh, play in, in the Queensland uh, Interest uh, Interest uh, Super Cup uh, competition to this day. So, so it's uh, uh, it's 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 a sport which has a lot a lot of value in many ways. Uh, and we have a number of our players uh, playing in in England as well. Have been recruited to play in England and in France uh, because of the pathway that's been established through rugby. And rugby yeah. used to be a big attraction for, especially for young people in this country uh, throughout. As you say, it builds wonderful people-to-people -people contacts and great sporting rivalry. Uh, so, Rabbi, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I'm sure that everyone has enjoyed this, this conversation. Um, your, your wisdom, your knowledge, your experience, uh, uh, you know, the way that you're able to apply that to the whole range of challenges at the Pacific and indeed our region and the world faces right now. Um, has been has been a real treat. Uh, we've tried to cover a lot of the issues raised by people on our questions. Again, apologies if we weren't able to get to to all of them. I um, hope you've enjoyed the conversation. So, Rabbi, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Stan. And all the very best. Thank you.